Good afternoon, and welcome to the first fall installment of the AAS Virtual Book Talk series. We are coming to you from the ancestral homeland of the Nipmuc tribal community, who remain an active and vibrant presence here in central Massachusetts. My name is John Garcia, AAS Director of Scholarly Programs. Today's book talk features Kristen Mucher and her monograph, Before American History, Nationalist Mythmaking and Indigenous Dispossession, published, published in 2022 by the University of Virginia Press. The presentation is sponsored by the Program in the History of the Book in American Culture. These virtual book talks showcase authors of recently published monographs broadly related to book history, print culture, and material texts. And now for a little background uh, for those new to AAS. The American Antiquarian Society is a national research library and a learned society. Our mission is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, grounded in our ever-growing collection of primary sources. We collect and make available books, pamphlets, manuscripts, newspapers, ephemera, and the graphic arts produced before 1900 in what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. The society fosters a broad community of inquiry through inclusive programs and generous support for scholarship. We welcome researchers from around the world to use our collections, both physical and digital, to, to help them with their projects. I'm joined behind the scenes by my colleague, Amanda Kondek. She'll be posting relevant information into the chat with prompts on how you can use the chat function. We encourage the audience to post questions for the Q&A part of the program. Amanda will also provide information for those wishing to purchase the book. As a reminder to all, the program is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel in the weeks to come. We thank you for joining us, joining us this afternoon. And as a nonprofit organization, we greatly appreciate any support you can provide. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kristen Mucher, who is Associate Professor of American Studies at Smith College. I've had the pleasure of knowing Kristen since 2015, when she was an NEH fellow at AES, working on the book that is the subject of today's presentation. Kristen's specializations lie in early American studies, native and indigenous studies, and early archeology span and anthropology. In addition to before American history, Kristen was co-translator of Stella, a novel of the Haitian revolution, published by NYU Press in 2015. And she co-edited the volume, Decolon Decolonizing Prehistory, Indigenous Knowledges and Deep Time in North America, which came out with the University of Arizona Press in 2021. Her research has been supported by the Newberry Library, the New York Historical Society, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And with that, I I'm happy to turn things over to Krista Mucher. Thank you so much, John, for that generous introduction. I'm not sure that I caught whether you said we were fellows at the same time, but that's the reason that John and I know each other, because we were both fellows working at the Antiquarian Society at the same time. I'm so delighted to be speaking in front of this audience today. So thank you, John, and thank you so much, Amanda, um, both of you for putting together what I hope will be uh, a successful presentation. This presentation is going to be image heavy and I'm going to move through them pretty quickly, but I'm happy to go back to anything in the Q&A. So uh, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Great, okay. It's my practice to begin my talks by acknowledging where I am in Native space as an attempt to be a good guest on someone else's homelands and in recognition of uh, the fact that Native people, despite going through many apocalypses, are still here. So I'll locate myself in Baltimore in the Chesapeake Bay lands. Uh, as you can see on your screen, shared homelands of Susquehannock, Piscataway, Conoy, Nanticoke, and other indigenous stewards who live here, in particular, the Lumbee people. Uh, as John said, also, I uh, acknowledge and give thanks to the very vibrant Nipmuc community, um, whose homelands the Antiquarian Society is located on. It is also my pleasure to be able to begin this talk 
uh, with reference to the UNESCO announcement that happened this week of the inscription of the Hopewell Ceremonial Earthworks on the World Heritage List. Uh, it's very exciting. These specific earthworks that are now recognized as um, pieces, as, as, as intellectual masterpieces and uh, intellectual and cultural masterpieces uh, are located along the waterways of Southwest Ohio, where I'm from, and some of the areas that I'll be discussing today um, touch on these, these same earthworks. This truly meaningful recognition is owed to the hard work of lots of people, um, and I'm so thankful for that, and I look forward to discussing the, the inscription perhaps a little bit more at the end. So this talk is based on my book, Before American History. Uh, this was published by the University of Virginia Press last year, and it is available open access for free uh, as an ebook download, thanks to the Mellon Foundation. You can also purchase it in paper if you are so moved. Uh, my book spans the years 1740 to 1840, roughly, and it argues that nationalists in the US and Mexico used similar intellectual and material strategies to misappropriate indigenous pasts in order to advance their own national projects by creating what they imagined to be an antiquity for the American continent. I argue that these nationalists, especially antiquarians and historians, crafted very specific versions of indigeneity that explicitly overwrote indigenous history. These intellectual activities made the settler nations more successful at eliminating the competition of indigenous polities on the lands that they were claiming. So in the book, I trace the circulation of ideas about the indigenous past through print materials, especially ones that attempt to reproduce or become antiquities themselves. And much of my project focused on piecing together a large dispersed archive of these antiquities. This talk largely draws from my fifth chapter, which focuses on Ohio um, in the first decades of the 19th century, but I'll first give a short overview of how my larger argument works. So the book follows as thematic through lines two examples of American antiquities, American antiquities, one from the place that became Mexico, commonly known as the Sunstone, um, and the other are the earthworks or the mounds of the Ohio Valley on which I'll focus today. Earthworks have a long history of being assigned origins to people other than the indigenous peoples of the continent. And I want to make clear that they were created by the ancestors of today's native peoples who are living right now. And even if they were not made by their ancestors' hands, these places continue to be uh, special, ceremonial, sacred, and awe-inspiring places, both to uh, indigenous people who are their stewards and those who live um, far away. So my book, uh, a particular thread of my book follows this idea of the creation of populations who made supposedly the earthworks who were not native. And so one of the threads that I follow is this idea of the Mexican migration um, and the way that the Mexican migration idea was taken up in the US as a way to understand the earthworks origins. So to explain that to you, I will just briefly say that in the 1740s, a Spanish subject went to New Spain and uh, gathered up by various means a huge collection of original documents created by indigenous people, lots of different kinds of documents, but the ones that I'm gonna focus on today have to do with narrations of native people's his own histories. So this is, uh, this is Lorenzo Bocherini who co collected all of these documents. And the reason that this is important in my argument is because uh, even though Bocherini that Botrini himself has a long history. Um, we're not gonna focus on him. The materials that he collected have a long afterlife. One of the first instances of this afterlife showing itself was when uh, uh, Francisco Claviero, who was a Jesuit 
uh, a Jesuit priest from New Spain who got ejected um, during the during the exile of the Jesuits. He re he had seen Bodorini's collection of these indigenous documents, and he recreated from memory while he was in exile in Italy uh, the narrative of pre-Columbian Mexican history from from his memory, and he wrote it in this book. Right, the um, uh, the the history of Mexico, and it was written first in Italian, and then it was translated into English in 1787. This was a wildly popular book. It helped that the Spanish Empire banned it. Um, but one of the most important things that I think uh, we can learn, we can take from Claviero is this idea of Mexican migration and also the preparing of various people to be able to identify uh, objects or the built environment as antiquities. So for example, Claviero remembering what he thought uh, he saw in the Bodorini documents had his Italian engravers create a copy of uh, um, what he thought was a calendar. And so at the time, 10 years later, when the, what we call the sunstone, when the sunstone was excavated in Mexico City, people who had reference to Claviero's work were already prepared to see this object in a particular way. Similarly, um, on your, on your, on your left, I guess, on your left, this is a little detail, detail from one of the manuscripts that Botterini collected. Um, it's now called the Codex Botterini. It describes the origin uh, and migration of the Mexica people. And what you're looking at right now is the very first episode of the very first ancestors leaving Etzlan. So the Claviero had seen this manuscript and then from memory, this is on your left, this is what he reproduced. Uh, and you can see some of the similar, some of the similar visual items um, and also some of the narrative content is the same with pretty heavy Christian overtones. This image from Claviero has an amazing afterlife. You see it um, in lots and lots of books in the 19th century. But for now, I just want to focus on the continuity of these shapes. So as you can see, um, there is a repetition of this idea of the of Aslan homeland when we start to get pictures of the earthworks. And so um, throughout the late 18th century and into the early 19th century, for the scholars who had read Claviero and some of the works that followed him, they were prepared when they saw the earthworks, they were prepared to identify them as Mexican monuments. And that helped them construct this fanciful uh, fiction about the origin of the people who had made the earthworks not being indigenous people, but instead being migrants who had come from Asia, gone to Mexico, and then come up and made the earthworks on the Ohio River. So for example, Thomas Jefferson obviously read Claviero. This is a letter of his to Charles Thompson, who was the uh, president of Congress, or secretary of Congress in 1787. I thank you also for the extract of the letter you were so kind as to communicate to me on the antiquities found in those Western countries, that antiquities here are the earthworks. It's too early to form theories on these antiquities. We must wait with patience till more facts are collected. I wish our philosophical society would collect exact descriptions of the several monuments as yet known and insert them naked in their transactions and continue their attention to those hereafter to be discovered. Patience and observation may enable us in time to solve the problem whether those who form the scattering monuments in our Western country were colonies sent off from Mexico or the founders of Mexico itself. Uh, just one more, and actually um, I can't read my, I can't read my own slide. So I'm going to let you all read that. Here is a passage from a speech by Manasseh Cutler when he was trying to explain what he thought the 
earthworks were for. He thought that they were sacred temples, and he was making a, a, a connection between the Teocalme in Mexico, the uh, temple structures in Mexico, and the earthworks that he saw in Marietta. So what I'd like you to understand with this last group of slides is that the uptake of the idea of Mexican migration, which includes the way the built environment was interpreted, as well as the, the perceived scholarly need for description and attention to so-called antiquities became a really important focus for US antiquarians. Because again, they were convinced that people other than the native folks of uh, the continent had made these monuments. Um, they had suggestions of creations by Vikings, by Welsh colonists, by Malaysians, by Mexicans, all kinds of ideas other than the current, uh, the ancestors of the current native people. So for this reason, the people who founded the AAS were also interested in these Mexican histories. For example, this is from this is a, a page from the papers of Thaddeus Mason Harris, which we have at the Antiquarian Society. Um, he spent most of his life documenting Mexican antiquities and antiquities of uh, of the continent more generally. This also meant that because that's what scholars were interested in, those were the kinds of books that the Antiquarian Society um, uh, focused on collecting. This is a relatively expensive version uh, of that of, of part of that collection. So this D John Delafield's An Inquiry into the Origin of the Antiquities of America, it says everything you need to know right there, um, includes, and this is so fantastic, includes a 13-foot reproduction of the Codex Boterini, except it's um, done out like an accordion rather than and rather than a screen fold as it as it is originally and um whoever was in charge of the reading room that day was nice enough to let me unfurl the whole thing so that i could try to get a look at it and it has a pretty fun history of its own uh so that that's in the the reading room as some of you might recognize so the one of the interests of the early members of the Antiquarian Society, as well as other philosophical societies, the APS in Philadelphia, was this um, particular interpretation of Mexican history. Another was trying to understand as much as possible about the mounds. Here is a line. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of things from the Antiquarian Society's collections because that's what's uh, most fun. So here is just a line from the draft of the inaugural uh, and the inaugural anniversary speech. I was trying to think of the word anniversary. The inaugural anniversary speech, which was given by William Jenks, who was professor of Oriental languages at Bowdoin. Uh, he gave this in 1814, and he was listing the priorities that he thought that the society should follow. And uh, the line here says, the second general subject of inquiry is the Western mounds of earth. The first general subject had been uh, indigenous histories, and this is the second general subject of inquiry. Next slide. So because there had been this emphasis on the earthworks as uh, antiquities and as something that the antiquarian society was very interested in, members were, uh, they were encouraged to send in anything that they knew, right? This was the idea of being able to have transcriptions, uh, dis descriptions of these earthworks as Jefferson said, so that they could lay them naked in their transactions. And so corresponding members from across the Eastern seaboard and then the membership very quickly, especially after 1815, very quickly grew into the Old South and into the Ohio Valley, the Old Southeast, well, the current Southeast, uh, and into the Ohio Valley. Um, so here we have a member who is living in Tennessee, who sent something in in 1822, describing, you can see the picture of the mound that he's driven, he's drawn there, the mound and the enclosure. I went through hundreds and 
I went through hundreds of papers similar to this. Um, and this was one of the, the main things that uh, the membership was sending back to Worcester at the time, sending to Boston and sending to Worcester at the time. So because the, be, because the idea was to provide this knowledge to the rest of the world, as it were, um, many of these correspondences describing the earthworks were published in the first volume of transactions, the um, transactions that was modestly named Archaeologia, uh, Archaeologia Americana. This was published in 1820, and uh, this is what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk. Here you can see all of the bound copies of the first volume that are held at the Antiquarian Society. Um, I think there's, I actually don't remember how many volumes there are, but the first volume is the 1820 and it's the first one. And uh, I hunt, I hunted them all down and, the, and that was really fun and a nerdy thing to do. Just so you know, we don't leave this Mexican narrative behind in the least. So here's a page from the transactions. Um, and if you turn your head to the side, perhaps you can make out that that's an engraving of the earthwork, the pyramid in Cholula um, in Mexico. Again, trying to make this connection between earthworks in the north and then all of the structures uh, in the south. But what I want to call your attention to, so here's the title page, what I want to call your attention to is the contribution to transactions that was made by this Ohio lawyer named uh, Caleb Atwater. So here we have the title page from his contribution, description of the antiquities discovered in the state of Ohio and other Western states communicated to the president of the American Antiquarian Society. Here's Atwater himself. Uh, Atwater moved from New York to Ohio in 1814, and he settled in Centerville, and I'll show you where that is on a map in a second. Here is a much reproduced engraving of Centerville, excuse me, not Centerville, Circleville. There's also a Centerville. Circleville. Circleville is named for the shape that it originally took when it was founded by white settlers, and that was uh, a shape of circles that encompass a central mound. And so for the first 20 years, Circleville was indeed um, in the shape of a circle, but the residents took the mounds apart relatively quickly and eventually the town was gridded um, and that specifically to help with the coming of the canals and the railroads. Caleb Atwater sent, settles in Circleville and instantly becomes enamored with the idea of American antiquities. And he makes, uh, he makes a commitment to go and survey all of the antiquities, meaning the earthworks, all of the antiquities that he can find. And uh, originally he starts just doing this for a small group of like-minded scholars and he publishes in a magazine in New York, but uh, the members of the Antiquarian Society read this and realize that they need to have him among their ranks. He's invited to become a member of the American Antiquarian Society, um, absolutely uh, jumps on the, this priority of gathering information about earthworks and um, starts sending correspondence back to Worcester. I meant to tell you where Circleville is. I don't think you can see my cursor. Um, if you if you can't see my cursor, you can imagine uh, you can see where the you can see where the rivers are. So here's here's a image from 1901. This is from an archaeological atlas from 1901 that shows where in 1901 all of the extant earthworks were in Ohio. This should just give you an, a sense of how many earthworks there were. A lot of these have been destroyed, and certainly by 1901, already so many had been destroyed. These were just what was um, still around in 1901. But what I want you to see about this is not just the volume, but the location. For the most part, the earthworks are located along the rivers, along the in the river valleys. Um, and 
Caleb Atwater moves to one of those river valleys. It's the Scioto River Valley. You can see the cat right here. It's the Scioto River Valley. And the Scioto River Valley is where all of the earthworks um, that he starts that he starts inspecting are all of the ones that we start getting images of that he's sending back to the antiquarian society. So here's uh, here's Ohio. Here is uh, Pickaway County. I realize that this is maybe more difficult to see if I don't have a pointer. So I've learned my lesson there. But Pickaway County, Circleville is the county seat of Pickaway. And uh, again, the red marks are to show you all of the, in 1901, um, extant earthworks, just to give you a sense of the absolute coverage that these uh, of the landscape. And so some of the ones that are recognized by UNESCO now are in Pickaway County, the, the, they're still there. Like I said, Atwater jumps on the chance to correspond with Worcester um, and sends massive amounts of letters and information to Thomas. So many, basically this is made possible by the fact that he was postmaster for a while. And so all of his uh, correspondence was free. He sent so many letters that he even would send letters listing the letters um, asking if Thomas, so that Thomas could make sure that he got them. Here's a letter, this is in Atwater's hand, uh, but those little crosses are in Thomas's hand. You can ask me how I know that because I know his handwriting very well, even his shaky little crosses in, uh, 19, in 1819. And at the bottom, it says 44 free letters in all. That was just July, August, September. He, uh, Atwater was a machine. He was sending so much information, so many descriptions, and all of these letters are pertaining to the earthworks um, that he's seeing around the state. Because he's a lawyer, he rides the, he rides, becomes a judge, he rides the circuit, and he goes around the state of what's the state of Ohio at the time and doing surveys. He's himself not doing surveys, um, but he is employing people to do surveys. And then he's sending pictures, uh, images of those surveys and descriptions back to Thomas. Thomas takes all of this correspondence and um, edits it, edits it with a pretty heavy hand, puts it together and makes it into the essay that becomes description of the antiquities discovered in the state of Ohio. And so I'm just showing you here an image of from the Isaiah Thomas papers. Um, and it says, letter from Caleb Atwater Esquire, uh, all necessary to be read. And, and then by which the, the necessary arrangement must be of his copy must be made. So you get the sense that this is um, absolutely a team effort. And also reading Atwater's correspondence shows just how deep he was into all of these alternate theories that thankfully Thomas doesn't quite let surface um, as much as we might be, uh, we might expect would otherwise happen. Here's an example of one of the surveys that gets published in transactions. So this is one of the surveys that Atwater commissions. Um, the, the, the volume is filled with surveys that look like this. This is, this is one of, this is a description of one of the Hopewell Mound group um, within those earthworks that were recognized. But lest we fall into the trap of thinking that the antiquarian society in the early 19th century was only interested in paper antiquities, I will remind you all that they had an equal interest in uh, works on paper, antiquities on paper, and material objects. And so, in fact, in 1819, one uh, the the membership voted that one of the conditions of membership was that you would send objects, antiquities, to Worcester as part of your membership dues. And so there was this expectation that the Antiquarian Society was both keeping up a library and an archive of historical documents, as well as a museum, a museum with objects. Most of those objects are no longer at the Antiquarian Society, at Antiquarian Hall, um, most but not all. But this was an 
equally important aspect of the of the society's work. You can see here, this is a blueprint that um, Isaiah Thomas annotated for the new antiquarian hall. So this is antiquarian hall two. Um, currently the, the, the antiquarian hall of today is in the footprint of antiquarian hall three. So this is, um, this is down the street, but uh, I will read out to you if, if, if it's, not quite legible. Up at the top corner, it says cabinet, so cabinet or museum. Cabinet, then going uh, counterclockwise, librarian's office, entry, stairway, room to meet in, right? So these are the things that were important to have, important enough to have in antiquarian hall. And then there's Thomas's annotations um, because Thomas paid for the building. The second largest room here is dedicated to the cabinet. So here is a uh, here's a a catalog of the items that Caleb Atwater sent to Thomas, and Atwater had been promising for years to send some of the items that um, that he had in his that he had in his possession, uh, but he didn't actually send anything until 1820. So, just to be really clear about this. Atwater was not just doing surveys. He was also excavating the earthworks. So he was not just uh, looking at the outside. He was also looking at the inside. And he was taking apart the earthworks, destroying the earthworks uh, to find out what was in them. And what was often in them were human bodies and human body and the and the grave goods. Uh, that were connected to the people who had been interred in these earthworks that were um, very frequently used for burial. Used for many things, but very frequently also for burial. So one of the things that we are witnessing here is not just a survey of earthworks, but also a survey of burial sites and burial sites that were systematically desecrated so as to try to figure out who made them? Now, uh, I will. I'll get back to this in a second. But Atwater was kind of was um, regularly taking items, and I'm using the word items kind of in square scare quotes there. Taking items. These are might be portions of human bodies. Taking items out of the earthworks and um, either um, either adding them to his own collection of antiquities or trading them with other people, or in the case, he, as you see here, sending them up to the antiquarian society. And to emphasize, the antiquarian society explicitly asked for these antiquities, right, which again included human um, portions of human bodies and, uh, and, and, and entirely, almost entirely grave goods. So this was an expected aspect of being a member. Here is the entry um, from that catalog that Atwater sent. Here's the entry in the donation book. Uh, so this is in this is in Thomas's hand. No, this isn't in Thomas's hand. This is in the secretary's hand. This is in Newton. This is secretary at this point. I can't remember. Um, uh, rejoice is his first name. Here is the all everything that was um, sent from Atwater in Circleville over to uh, over to Worcester. And um, I make it a practice not to display human remains, but, and, and so I am not doing so, um, and behind that little a rectangle there I have blurred out, blurted out. But here's an image from the end of the 19th century. This is from the AES's website um, of the reading room. And um, there's a vitrine here that I am almost positive was the vitrine that had the Ohio antiquities in it because there was a display specifically of Ohio antiquities. And that display was up at least through the 1860s, because there are descriptions of it in later versions of 
the proceedings of the AAS proceedings, but I am almost certain that it was up in some form to the 1890s, if not a little bit later. So at this point, I should tell you that um, all of the human remains, all of the grave goods are, are all gone. They are not at the Antiquarian Society any longer. Most of them went to the Peabody at Harvard um, and the Peabody re retains most of those, most of those um, antiquities to this day, although I know that they are slowly starting to um, fulfill their repatriation duties. Okay, so the thing to say now is that you would have, were you to visit Antiquarian Hall, you would have seen these human remains and grave goods on display as antiquities. Um, but also if you read transactions, you would have seen these. So one of the, um, one of the main points that I make in my fifth chapter in my book is that almost all of the engravings in the first volume of transaction come from graves. And so for me, that raises the question of the ethics of reproducing or continuing to put on display um, human beings or spiritual objects uh, j just because this group of scholars in the early 19th century thought that they were antiquities and thought that they were absolutely not connected with Native Americans. So um, this gets me to my the title of my talk, which is specifically about removal. So removal in the archive. Since all of these scholars, Atwater uh, included, they had decided that earthworks and the objects inside earthworks were not connected to local people. Um, and so when they took things out of the mounds, uh, they, they didn't think that those items had any connection either. So what, um, what are some of the, what are some of the aspects that went into this assumption? Atwater lived on Shawnee lands. This is a picture of the Pickaway Plains front. This is an image from um, uh, 1847, but it's um, a good approximation of what the Pickaway Plains would have looked like at in the hmm, 1770s or 1780s. At the top of the square, you see a circle. That's where Circleville would be um, would be located later. Uh, if you follow that, what looks like a road, it is a road, it's a, it's a raised embankment, and it connects down to um, what would become the white town of Chillicothe as well, where there are a lot of, where there are a lot of earthworks. So he settled, Atwater settled in Pickaway, uh, in Pickaway County on the Pickaway Plains in 1814. Um, most of the Shawnee people had either been killed or um, uh, killed or run off during the Revolutionary War or during the territorial wars in the seven in, that continued after the Revolutionary War in the 1780s and 1790s. So most of those Shawnee families, by the time that uh, that Atwater would have gotten there, were gone and had moved north, um, still living in what Ohio thought as its own lands, but north of the Scioto Valley. To remind you, after the Northwestern Territorial Wars that ended in 1794, there was a boundary drawn between Indian country and the United States. Um, and here's a picture of that boundary right there. Sometimes it's referred to as the 1795 Treaty Line. So 20 years later, one consequence, and, and what that meant was after the war, all native people had to live above the treaty line in Indian country, not in what became Ohio. Uh, 
one consequence of this is that because Native people had been effectively removed from the areas most heavily covered in earthworks, and so I've done a kind of poor job of overlaying this here, but so you can see, um, most of the earthworks are south of the of the treaty line. Because they had been effectively removed from those areas, many of settlers like Atwater uh, were able to convince themselves that there was no connection. Um, and with the constant excavation and the destruction, this history was erased. And so this just became further, quote unquote, proof that there was no connection. Um, but I, I pause because this is... Um, this is a moment to understand that these were justifications and these were a particular way of interpreting history and interpreting the past that had everything to do with the political moment of the time. I also wanna point out that um, something that is unsettling, something that should be unsettling is just the realization that we as historians, are, we're still relying on the collections of grave goods and the erasure of earthworks, um, and and thereby and thereby the erasure of long-standing native history, which has been recast as American antiquities and continues to um, masquerade as such uh, with with regularity. So one one goal I suggest is to pay more attention to these links um, to understand actions such as the destruction of these cultural spaces and the removal of native populations as constitutive of, not incidental to the creation of American archives. Um, and we need to talk more about it, I think, which is not about virtue signaling, but or, or about eliciting feelings of shame or guilt, but instead helping us to commit to be better stewards um, and understanding both what we have, but also what's been taken in order to get where we are. So the way that this, this crystallized, these links crystallized for me was when I was in residence at the AAS um, and I was puzzling through two other aspects of Atwater's essay. One is this really beautiful, intricate map of Ohio that he had, that he had to have included. And this map almost bankrupted the, the society. And the other one is a letter from Ohio Indian agent John Johnston, that's his farm um, uh, in Piqua, Ohio. Atwater had written to Johnston in 1818 asking about antiquities. Johnston had instead responded uh, with, not about antiquities, but with, not about earthworks, but with a list of the numbers and locations of all of the native people who lived in Ohio in 1819. And, and you can see that it gets included in Atwater's essay. Here's, this is uh, Johnston's handwriting. Here's what it looked like as printed up. So uh, what you can see here is that the 18, you see the 1819 date and also all of the people are situated on specific, what they're called here towns. These are all reservations because by 1819, all native people who were living within the bounds of Ohio were living on reservations. Many people don't know that Ohio had reservations, but after a series of treaties in 18, uh, 17 and 18, 18, um, this series of treaties which erased the treaty line and gave, and the US government then gave all of the former Indian country land to the state of Ohio. So it became the state of Ohio, but there were these small parcels of land that were reserved for um, the tribal communities. And so native people in order to remain within the bounds of what Ohio was now claiming as its own state territory had to live on one of these reservations. These reservations were not very long lived, um, but nonetheless, there's a way that we can see how at the same time that Atwater was working, there was this transformation in the state and this removal of Native people from their own homes onto these specific uh, confined communities. And then within, uh, within 15 more years, um, exiled to Indian country. So here is that map again. 
just to give you a sense of where I'm talking about in terms of where the reservations were. Uh, and you can see on this map this, this, this process. The map was being made um, to be published in 1820. So it was being made while these land changes were happening. And Atwater was writing to Abner Reed and saying, you have to change this map, you have to change this map. And there is, there are a couple of tells. And one I want to show you is that even though this was published in 1820, so the treaty line is gone. Here's, um, here's a, here's a close-up view. And this is the view that's in my book as well. Uh, you can still see the treaty line because it's still on the map that Abner had originally drawn. There, there it is, right? That's not part of the county lines. Um, and you can also see some of the reservations. So here's the Lewiston Reserve, that which wasn't there on the original map. Uh, you can also see the Wapakoneta Reserve up there. I also point out the name of the map, which is map of the state of Ohio, including the Indian reservations purchased and laid out into counties and townships in 1820. Okay, I want to end here, um, which is to say that not long after these treaties are signed and the native communities are moved into reservations, they were then um, ejected from Ohio and sent to Indian territory. And one of the people who was in charge of this was John Johnston, which is not a surprise. And he personally saw off the last Wyandotte group. Um, so as a result, there are no federally recognized tribal communities in Ohio today. That is only one of the reasons that this UNESCO recognition is so important because it gives in the smallest, in, in one of the, in a small way, it reinvests Ohio with indigenous history rather than with this falsified American antiquarian history. Um, and this, the recognition therefore also rehumanizes these earthworks as actually made by uh, human indigenous creators. And so I'll leave with the words of the Eastern Shawnee chief, Glenna Wallace, who worked tirelessly to get this recognition underway. Quote, she says, on Tuesday, she said, the world will now see and recognize the commitment, spirituality, imaginative artistry, and knowledge of complex architecture to produce magnificent earthworks. Our ancestors were true geniuses. So that's, that's, that's the end for my talk, and I cannot wait to um, have some questions. Fantastic, Kristen. Thank you so much. This is this is really uh, really amazing work. Um, uh, just so the audience knows, um, and you can see in the, in, in the chat that the Q and A portion of the program is now open. So we invite you to to post your questions there, and we'll get we'll get to them uh, as as in due course as much as we can. Um, um, as as we're waiting for people to uh, to think of more and to process <laughs> all of this work that you that you've shared with us. Um, you know, um, I have a question I want to ask, and one thing as I, um, you know, as uh, as you know, as you were speaking, and you you were talking so much about the Antiquarian Society, which is which is just amazing, and it's a story that people need to know more about. Um, you know, there's one thing that I think should also be mentioned is that Thomas was interested in uh, in colonial uh, colonial Mexico um, prior to this moment, right? When he wrote the history of the book in printing. He, there's things that I know, and I know you know this and you know another thing that we could add to as well is that the second librarian CC Baldwin who I remember you talked about him so much do you want to say a little bit about Baldwin or no please I don't uh, yeah you 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 go ahead no just just quickly I mean I uh you know Scott Casper told me the other day that he, that Baldwin passed away when he was heading to Ohio to collect more antiquities. <laughs> so, so he uh, was actually going to Illinois because he had a scheme that he was going to try to take an entire mound with him and bring it back. And, and he got ill and passed away. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's an amazing story. Um, you know, your, your work is it's, it's hemispheric, it's transnational, and there's so much that, that you cover in the book. I'm just curious if, if, you know, if you were to continue this project to go further or, 
if you want to share more about portions of the book that you didn't have time to talk about today. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, one of the one of the questions when turning a messy dissertation into a book is a question of scope. And so I really needed to focus on, so I, I picked the US and Mexico. There were already all of these very obvious connections that I saw, but I picked those two spaces to, to focus on because I saw the way that they were creating these new nations, post-colonial, these settler nations um, to be, to be working in tandem, to be sharing resources and doing things parallel, not in the same way, but they were doing things in a parallel way. I spent a long time trying to decide if um, Haiti and Canada were part of this story. And I went and I went back and forth. And um, I do think that there is something very interesting to say about early Haiti's relationship to indigeneity and its imagined um, connection to Taino history, um, the word IET, right, for example. And then, but but um, it didn't work in terms of the, the settler nation because Haiti has a different history as the first free black nation in the hemisphere. Similarly, uh, Canada doesn't fit because of Canada's ongoing relationship with its colonial uh, what uh, connections, I don't know, um, with, with Britain. And so that's the reason that I specifically focused on this. But yes, if I weren't just focusing on settler nationhood, um, I think there's a much larger story here. And it has to do with the way that... Um, the way that indigeneity has been used by non-indigenous people to um, their own non-indigenous people's ends. And so that is a story that we can, that, that is current. Um, and that is a story we can go back um, 600 years for. And, and as you close, you know, at the end of the talk, it, it comes into the present as well. Right. Right. Um, right. Exactly. Last slide. Um, I, I see that we're, uh, we're we're waiting for some more questions to come in. Um, uh, you know, as a, as a follow up, you know, and it, this really came out especially in the presentation, right? The range of materials that you showed in, in the slides, right? Um, you talk about printed books, right? You talk about engravings in books. You uh, you mentioned in, in 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 the actual book that, that you wrote, you talk about manuscript maps. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it even comes down to a kind of material culture aspect, right? About mounds and, you know, artifacts and all this. And, you know, I'm just curious um, more generally, do you have any suggestions for um, for other scholars who are, are interested in, in, in writing histories that involve material culture? Um, I guess my, my words of wisdom are to be as, expansive in your definition of material and culture, and also to try to have as much time as you can, because it's slow going. And w one of the things that I found is that, you know, you have to learn about the form, each each item of material culture, you have to learn about its form, right? They don't work in the same way. And even if they travel along the same circuits, um, or even if they're produced by the same people, they, their, their form matters. And their form also kind of dictates the way that they've been handled and then interpreted for however however long that they are. So I would say, actually, that weirdly, it's like a formalist um, a formalist suggestion, which is to be really attentive to 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 the material of the culture because I think that sometimes um, we just say something is an X and that's enough, and then we treat it like a book, or we treat it in the way that we think uh, a manuscript works and and they don't they don't all work the same way i see here that uh rebecca rosen uh, has a question here she says might the new designation as a unesco heritage work site help enable the return of some some of these items from uh the peabody under uh under under nagpa nagpa sorry yeah that's a i mean that's a great question and there are probably people out there who know a lot more than i do about this i do know that there are new 
NAGPRA um, regulations that are that are we're awaiting at the end of the year. So hopefully that will, um, in fact, make uh, organizations like the Peabody more willing to to comply with the spirit, if not just the letter of of the act. Um, but this designation won't help because the specific problem is that excavated uh, human remains or grave objects that have been treated, that have been made into objects and have been treated as antiquities, often in, in the course of doing that, people like Atwater, um, all context of where they've come from has been mixed up or lost. And uh, there was so much at the beginning of, of, if there was any context, there was so much insistence that these were not related to local people that current day tribes have a very difficult time, even now, contesting those claims from the 19th century. So one of the things that historians or others who work with this material can do is to show that these were false narratives in the 19th century. They continue to be false narratives and they and they shouldn't be used um, as a way to continue disconnecting native people from their ancestral heritage objects, even if there's not an explicit link between the tribe as they exist, the federally recognized tribe as they exist today and the time period um, that these that these items were taken. So it's a good question. It's unnecessarily complicated, and hopefully we're going to get some more guidance. Um, but I do know that the Peabody has been they've been they've been working a little harder recently. I see here that uh, James Maffey um, in the audience just says, "Amazing talk, Kristen. Congrats." <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that's something that uh, everybody here um, uh, shares that as well. Um, uh, you know, one, another aspect of the, of the book that, um, and, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out that, that the prose in, 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 in it is really beautiful. And, and one thing that I think is hard to, to convey, um, in, in, in the webinar or through the, or through your slideshow is the fact that you, you incorporate more than just historical sources, right? Um, each chapter, um, has voices that that you position to speak back to settler colonials. And I see, you know, I tracked it as indigenous writers, historians, philosophers, and every chapter begins with poetry. And I'm just curious if you could say more about how these range of voices in the present help us to understand the archives from the past that you're interested in, how, how it helps us to understand things differently. Um, thank you. I. I think my first instinct is to say it's an attempt to put a crack in the echo chamber. So these communities that I'm writing about, uh, this, the scholarly communities, are are very insular. Um, for the most part, they're not made up of indigenous scholars, for the most part. Um, and so my, my invitation to current day indigenous voices is a way of keeping myself as enabling myself to try to escape that echo chamber. One of the things that sometimes happens, thank you for complimenting my prose. One of the things that sometimes happens to those of us who um, write about the 19th century is that we can fall into the trap of using the language of our uh, subjects. And sometimes that's romanticized language, sometimes that's euphemistic language. Um, but all of it uh, doesn't help us reimagine or understand better the materials that we're, that we're looking at. And so I was trying to be insistent with myself, and then hopefully also with the reader, um, as, as, uh, as a way to keep these other voices like very literally at the top of, of our minds. Great. We have, uh, there's a number of questions here um, in, in, in the Q&A. We have uh, Laura Davis uh, Delano says she has two questions. Uh, did any of the antiquarians settlers talk to native, native people about the mounds and earthworks? And B, uh, it is good to hear about the UNESCO decision, but um, it seems that the Hopewell ceremonial earthworks will be uh, managed by settler uh, governments. Is there a possibility 
that this uh, earthworks site and other such sites will be returned to contemporary uh, Native nations. I think you've addressed that the second part, but do you want to talk about the first part? I, I can speak to that second part a little bit, which is that um, they are, it, it is a collaboration with the three Shawnee tribes. So the the Hopewell uh, UNESCO bid was in collaboration with the three Shawnee tribes. Um, so control is a difficult question. It ultimately is under the control of the Ohio, it's the Ohio Historical Society, it's called the Ohio History Connection. Um, but they have actually a, a really admirable commitment to be partners with tribal nations and not to have um, not to have kind of unilateral directorship. Uh, the question of land back, I think, is is a bigger one. Um, what was what was the first part, John? All right. the fir The first part was. Um, uh, sorry, let me go. From Laurel. I think. Uh, sorry, it may have been deleted. Sorry. Um, we can uh, we can share the questions with you with you later. Oh, we see here. Amanda has it. Did any of these antiquarian settlers talk to native people about the oh, amount of works? Um, Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Yes. Not a lot. And what happened was you would have a certain small number of these antiquarians. Usually they were missionaries, not always, but usually they were missionaries um, who would speak with either, uh, let's say, Christian native people in their, in their, um, in their mission community, uh, or who would speak to people who, who had been living, like say, on the on the reservation. But there are very few, and those re which is to say, there are very few written down records that got taken up by East Coast intellectuals. Do I think that some people had more everyday conversations? Yes. But do I think that those settlers were really prepared to hear whatever it was that they were hearing? No. So even if they got that information, which they did there, and, and it has kind of floated up, it, you can see it in some of the newspapers of the time or some of the periodicals. Um, but usually anything that expressed some sort of connection between Native people and the earthworks was, was, um, was dismissed as impossible. Uh, Ashley Cataldo says, thank you, Kristen, uh, uh, from, from an archivist at AAS. Uh, for a long time, we at, a at AAS have known these objects. We still haven't uh, written a critical history of the institution, um, uh, nor have we altered our catalog ent entries, um, time staffing and, and other constraints, as she mentions. Um, she's curious to know what your suggestions are for moving forward as an institution. Uh, and making sensitive uh, archives available um, to the public. Yeah. Well, Ashley, this is this is this is such an important question. It's such a big one. Um, you know, I know that the uh, association, and I'm going to forget the actual name, the Association of Tribal Archivists and Historians have put out various kinds of guidance about this, um, and that the APS has been doing some work to do exactly what you say, change some of their labels and. You know, one of the things is, I think at the very, very least, and I didn't do this, so I'm I'm in violation of what I'm about to say, is to put out warnings um, about the about the harm that can be caused by viewing casually viewing human remains and and funerary objects and um, other uh, other things, and I'm saying thing, uh, maybe other persons that are alive. Um, that have been instead kind of cooped up in these archives, and so uh, I don't have I don't have specific guidance, but I do think that at the first step, a, a warning, so that both um, people, indigenous people who may have additional harm um, done to them by seeing these objects, will at least be 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 warned, but also so that people who would otherwise use images or objects too freely um, have to have a second thought. And I've seen so many presentations where scholars use these images too freely. Please do not include mummies in your presentations. Thank you. Great. Um, more more, um, more feedback. You know, we have uh, Ty Smart at the end. Uh, watch, it's been wonderful to hear you speak um, on your research. Um, and we have time, I think, for, for one more. We have from uh, Scott Sanders, who says, first of all, full disclosure, Dr. Mutcher volunteered uh, in my archives many years ago. 
um, and he's enjoyed watching the development of your of your project. But his question concerns the terms used uh, to describe these prehistoric cultures. Uh, do we still refer to them as uh, Adena, Hopewell, and Fort Ancient? Um, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Fort, Fort Ancient, uh, Ancient yeah. People. Um, I've been calling them uh, the woodland uh, cultures for some time. Good job. Um, uh... <sighs> Do we still use those terms? No. Are those terms still used? Yes. Is Hopewell, I, I, I think that there must have been some really tense negotiations for getting the name of that UNESCO site. Um, but I was very happy to hear at the interview on NPR on Tuesday, someone from the Ohio History Connection, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was, made it very clear that Hopewell is not the name of a people, that it is um, an old fashioned way that archeologists designated culture areas. And it is named after uh, 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 the farm of a white settler that has nothing to do with it has nothing to do with anything. And so these names are still used. Um, and it's just we just all have to try really hard to to push them out because Adina and Hopewell and Fort Ancient are not useful. Fort Ancient, I I go ahead and say, I think that the thought right now is calling them proto Shawnee because Fort Ancient is the most most recent of those cultural cultural areas. But um, they, they're not separate people. They are groups of people who are existing at the same time. And, um, Scott, you know, Orator's Mound says Adina burial mound on it right now. And that just makes me want to rip out my eyes. Uh, I guess it's better that it doesn't say Orator's Mound anymore, but it, all over the place, these things are mislabeled. And these are just missed opportunities to actually acknowledge Indigenous history. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Kristen. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I know the audience uh, uh, just is, is just blown away by this work like I am. Um, uh, we do have to end, and I just want to encourage everybody uh, to check out the AAS website for more information about public programs in the weeks to come. Uh, on October 5th at 7 p.m., you can join us for, for a virtual talk by Margareta Lavelle on her book, Painting the Inhabited Landscape, Fitzhugh Lane, and the global reach of antebellum America. We also have on October 12th, uh, a, a program uh, with featuring Lawrence Buell that'll be uh, virtual both in person and, uh, uh, and, and online. Uh, this is on Henry David Thoreau, Thinking Disobediently. Uh, we also have, uh, there's so much coming up. There's on uh, October 19th, we have the 18th annual Baron Lecture, which will give, be given by Nell Painter on Sojourner Truth was a New Yorker and she didn't say that. Uh, and this is also a hybrid program. And last but not least, we just wanna advertise the next installment of the virtual book talk series. And that will feature Carolyn Wigington on her new book, Indigenuity, Native Craftwork and the Art of American Literatures. And you can check out these and more on the AAS website. Once again, thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, and we'll see you next time.